Let us out. <clears throat> the Savior comes. The Savior promised long. Let every heart prepare a room and every voice a song. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> In the name of our Advent King Jesus, dear and treasured brothers and sisters of our Savior, of the church family, and our chapter. When prominent people come to visit, we do the best we can to prepare the place so that the visitors will be impressed. And so it was that when the Communist Chinese Party leader she was expected in Los Angeles. The governor pulled out all the stops for the first time in years, sent out the street cleaners and an army of people with mops and buckets. The police tore down all the illegal tents put up by illegal aliens who had flocked into the sanctuary city. And it had been a jewel of a city on the West Coast, but now maps were circulating to spot where the open dumps of feces were located throughout the city so that one would accidentally step into one. She was going to see none of this as the city did a major overhaul. Probably so. Oriental countries have not forgotten the art of preparing a welcome. When a special person comes to town, the excitement builds up days in advance. Companies vie with one another to put up beautiful archways over the main roads to be traveled. The crowds line the streets. The dignitaries are met by children and young ladies who are carrying lamps and strew flower petals on the path on which the visitors are going to walk. Garlands are placed around their necks, bouquets are given to them, and a framed declaration of Welcome printed in gold is read aloud and is presented. Such are the preparations for welcoming a special dignitary, Oriental style. In our I'm as good as you are society, we have perhaps lost a bit of this art. Preparations, if any, are minimal, even for a high ranking individual. A few people are involved, and so. Is it becoming foreign to us to prepare for the birthday celebration of the Christ child? Is the coming of Christmas becoming ho hum? What is really involved in true preparation? And are we losing a part of it in this 21st century as we move along in these days? Well, John the Baptizer showed us the way. And in Luke chapter 3, which is the Synoptic Gospels parallel to the Mark passage, we read this. John, the son of Zechariah, came in the wilderness. He went into the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. God. Now from this text, we want to consider the theme, prepare the way of the Lord. This was the call of John to the Jews of his day, and strangely it is God's call to us today. It has not changed. It's thrilling, and it's piercing, and it's a demanding call. It comes through loud and clear. Perhaps you remember years ago there was a hit musical Jesus Christ Superstar, and it had that song, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And it was spoken clearly and strongly to the people who saw that show in those days. Well, John the Baptizer was a forerunner, or the pioneer for Christ. Even as an infant in the womb of Elizabeth, he leaped 
for joy when he came close to Christ for the first time. He was prepared thoroughly in the wilderness for this task. God had called him to prepare the way for his son, and he was to open a trail into people's hearts to receive the kingdom of God. Now he did this as he spoke to his own countrymen in the province of Judea, where Pontius Pilate was the governor. Now, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, we hear, but rustic John, with his camel's hair garments, and his world economic forms preferred diet of locusts and wild honey, stuck out like a sore thumb even before he spoke a word. Note how careful the writer, Dr. Luke, is about the historical details here. He says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being the governor of Judea, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of the region of Eturia and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, and the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now, with all of these historical hooks, we can date this clearly in the year of our Lord, A.D. 29. And our Google Maps can zero in on a spot in an exact place where this was on the Jordan River. This is no fairy tale like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or Gilgamesh or the Mahabharata or Dumbo. They are real flesh and blood people we are dealing with here who live and who love and had real problems and real sicknesses, who had hopes and dreams and ambitions, and they longed for contact with God. Well, John's message was not confined to these people in their country at that time. It applies to all people of all nations everywhere. It applies clearly to us today as well. John himself did not have the power to open the people's hearts. On his own, he just wasn't able to prepare the way of the Lord and to make his path straight. He couldn't know how every valley would be filled and every mountain and hill brought low and the crooked made straight and the rough place ways smooth. There was no earth-moving equipment that could open this road, but God provided John with the means and that means was his word. He was sent to preach a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now this was dynamite. St. Paul later said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And the Greek word for power is dynamis, which of course is the root for the English word dynamite. That's where it comes from. John preached repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Words of dynamite. Listen to them. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits that befit repentance. Boom! And the people were stunned. And they repented. And they were baptized for a baptism of repentance. Tom Skinner was a black gang leader in New York. He was planning a battle with a rival gang the next day. And as he sat at the desk where he was planning, his radio was on, and he was mocking the evangelist who was making grammatical mistakes in his sermon. But suddenly, he was stopped short as he heard, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away, and all has become new. Boom! His whole life was changed. He walked into his gang's den the next day and said he was quitting, and he walked out to a new life, and he became a chaplain to street gangs in New York City. Augustine had been a profligate in his youth, like a prodigal son, involved in debauchery of all kinds. One day as he was walking in a garden, he heard a distinct voice that said, pick it up, read it. 
they took that as a command to read the Bible. So he picked it up, and the first thing he read was from Romans 13. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual excess and lust, not in quarreling and jealousy, rather put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. Boom! He turned from his sin and was baptized and became a Christian leader in his day. Luther could find no way to assuage his conscience. And he hated the phrase righteousness of God because he just couldn't become that righteous. But in studying Romans, he read, he who through faith is righteous will live. Boom! He felt like he was altogether born again and then entered paradise. And you know the rest of the story. Several years ago, a tall, gaunt man was preaching repentance in the center of the city of Toronto in the middle of the street that Young and Queen were standing there leaning up against Edens. And a real agitated crowd had gathered, and he was saying, God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. You have placed other gods before him, and you are damned to hell unless you repent. And he said, God says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You have taken the name of the Lord in vain, and you will be damned eternally unless you repent. And he continued with the rest of the Ten Commandments. Now, the crowd got more and more agitated. Now, why? In the center of sophisticated Toronto, where they had heard everything and done everything, where people have imagined whatever they can imagine, why would a crowd of agitated people gather around that man and that message which was pure law. Well, the dynamite of God's word had cut through to their hearts and they were stunned. How about us? Do we sometimes think repentance is something for the heathen, but not for good people? We have such minor sins, we think. A little bit of selfishness here, perhaps. Some temper there, perhaps. A bit of worldly fun now and then. Then occasionally some indifference or apathy to the needs of others or some secret peccadilloes. But no great scarlet sins that cry out for vengeance we think. But those so-called small sins are just as damning. Whoever is guilty of one offense is guilty of them all, said James. They too pinned Christ to the cross and caused his blood to flow. And unless we also repent of these sins and bring forth fruit that is worthy of repentance, we too will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The hills and the mountains of our pride must be blasted level. The crooked words, the false deeds need to be straightened out before King Jesus can come in. The color of the parents during Lent we see are blue. Now, this is a new color representing hope that was introduced a few years ago. Hope. But before that, for years and years, it was always purple, the same as it was during Lent, because Advent also is a 
season of repentance. And the Bible says, godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret. And this is what John calls us to do today. And it brings us to that second part of John's message. It's a message of baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Most people today are woefully unaware of the importance of the forgiveness of sins. At the corner of First and Elm Street in St. Thomas, beside the Redeemer Lutheran Church building, stand three stainless steel, narrow flanged crosses, the largest central one standing 30 feet high. Now at this busy intersection, thousands of people pass by and Jeremiah's lament is fitting. Is it nothing to you who pass by? No one stops to ask about the cross and forgiveness. As many times as I've been there and walked on the sidewalk in front of that, there has never been anyone who has stopped me and said, what does this mean? It's in nobody's mind as they push heedlessly on their Broadway that leads to destruction. Is it nothing to you who pass by? Baptism for the forgiveness of sins was something new for the Jews at that time. If they knew of baptism, proselyte baptism, or ritual washing, but before this time, the forgiveness of sins came through the sacrifices in the temple. This was a structure and a detailed action that had trained the people well, and they were a sign of what was coming. Well, that new day was dawning. The sacrifice to end all of these sacrifices was now walking the land. One day, as John was baptizing, Jesus came along that bank of that river, and he pointed to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God, that final sacrifice. To him all the Old Testament sacrifices and rituals had pointed. It's through Christ alone that anyone, anywhere, has ever received the forgiveness of sins. We believe in the forgiveness of sins. It is part of the Christian creed that we confess we could never live without this forgiveness. Daily we sin much and deceive, indeed deserve nothing but punishment. And this burden of sin keeps us weighed down more and more day by day if we have no relief. But the blood of God's Son cleanses us from all sin. And when we repent of these offenses to God and have transferred them over to Christ, God declares us not guilty, and he removes these offenses as far as the east is from the west. He casts them into the depths of the sea, and actually, as our all-knowing God, remembers our sins no more. A clean page is turned in our book. We never need to go back to those old sins because Christ has dealt with them once and for all because of his payment on the cross. The just for the unjust, that is what it means to have them forgiven. But the greatest gift in the world, because along with it comes eternal life. And the text says it this way, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. How we yearn that all flesh would see it, but it's so ordinary, so common. A shabby old man in a jewelry store with a small rock like a bird's egg. His father had found him out in the field years ago, and it was lying around the house for all this time. 
and everybody had played with it. And the man gave it to the jeweler to examine. The jeweler looked at it for several minutes, and he spoke, Mister, your pebble isn't just an ordinary rock. It's a pigeon's blood ruby and had 24 carats. It was perfect in color, in texture, full of red fire, and worth $250,000. Familiar little pepper. Advent is so similar. It's familiar. It's been with us from childhood. It's been around the house. It's the time we baked Christmas cookies. It's the time we put up garlands, set up the Christmas tree, decorated. We begin to light the Advent candles in the Advent wreath. And it's very common, and very ordinary, and something we always have done. But it holds extreme value like a precious gem. This extremely precious forgiveness of sins and salvation, with which we are very familiar, approaches us in Christmas again this year. Let's dust out those cobwebs of our heart. Let's straighten out that guest room there. Let's decorate it with the garlands of humility and remember that it was washed up once and for all in the waters of baptism. And then in true repentance, straighten out the pathway there. Push away those stones of stumbling so that the way will be properly and truly prepared for our Lord. Yes, the cry is needed. The cry is true, and the cry is precious. Prepare the way of the Lord. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in